Hello and welcome to today's conversation on mitigating fraud and risk on the ACH network. I'm Pranav Deshpande, Head of Product Marketing at Modern Treasury, and I'll be your moderator for today. Thank you all for joining us. The ACH network is thriving. Almost $73 trillion in payments were processed over ACH in 2021. That's the ninth consecutive year when the value of ACH payments grew by $1 trillion or more. ACH is undoubtedly the most widespread electronic payments network in the US today being used for everything from payroll and direct deposit to newer use cases like marketplace payments and embedded finance. But this rapid growth in payment volumes, combined with the diversity in payments use cases, has made fraud and risk mitigation for ACH payments more important than ever before. We think about this topic a lot at Modern Treasury. Our payment operations software makes it easy to initiate, track, and reconcile payments so that our customers can handle complex fund flows easily at scale. But because we're unlocking automated money movement, building the right fraud and risk controls is a top priority for us. In today's webinar, we brought together experts from NACHA, Modern Treasury, and Settle to discuss tools and best practices that companies and their bank partners can use to stay on top of the constantly evolving risk landscape for ACH payments. We'll start with two quick presentations, one from NACHA and Modern Treasury, to set us up for an insightful panel discussion. But before we dive in, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panelists for today. We're joined by Amy Morris, Senior Director of ACH Network Rules at NACHA. Amy is responsible for leading and participating in working groups in the payments industry, collaborating with participants on changes to operating rules and educational activities. Amy has over 20 years of experience, previously working at Navy Federal Credit Union, FIS, and Visa. Thank you so much for joining us today, Amy. Next, we have George Reminick, who is a Senior Compliance Manager at Settle. Settle is a cash flow management platform for modern e-commerce companies and brands, providing all-in-one bill pay and invoice management, accounts payable, and access to short-term financing solutions. In his role, he is responsible for building and improving Settle's compliance program through en enhancing the company's policies, procedures, and automated controls. Prior to joining Settle, George worked with numerous financial institutions, including Citi and Deutsche Bank, assisting them with compliance program assessment and improvement. Thank you for being here, George. And finally, we have Eric Greenstein, who is the product manager for compliance at Modern Treasury, where he leads the development of our best-in-class KYC and AML tools. Prior to Modern Treasury, Eric was a senior product manager at Abnormal Security. He earned his MBA from Stanford's Graduate School of Business. Thank you for being here, Eric. Welcome again, everyone, uh, to today's discussion. Um, and I'm gonna kick things off by handing the presentation over to Amy, who's gonna set the stage for us by uh, walking us through how NACHA thinks about risk management on the ACH network. Over to you, Amy. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with everybody today to talk about um, Notch's approach to risk management and how we are handling that through both rulemaking and outreach to the industry through events such like this. A little bit of level setting, as Praneef said, the ACH network is thriving. Um, when we talk about the modern ACH network, it's important to understand that the transactions don't actually run through NACHA. Um, we have two system operators, the Federal Reserve and the Clearinghouse, and approximately 10,000 endpoints. So almost every financial institution in the United States and then some. Uh, right now, we're averaging about 120 million payments per day flowing through the ACH network, and those settle up to four times times per day and that is our overnight window as well as the four opportunity excuse me the three opportunities each day that we have um, for same day ACH settlement so as you see at the last bullet we have the ability to handle same day payments both debits and credits um, one day payments debits and credits as well um, as well as uh, credits that can be entered into the network up to two days in advance so a lot of flexibility in the the modern ACH network uh, to be able to handle that high volume of payments that we were just talking about. 
I'm also going to do some level setting here and talking about <clears throat> the different players in the ACH network. So oftentimes when you hear about the activities at NACHA, you hear about rulemaking um, or risk mitigation through the ACH network, there can be some um, you know, terms that are thrown around. We have alphabet soup. We like a lot of acronyms. So I wanted to go over quickly the, uh, the actual um, T types and roles of the participants in the ACH network. Um, as you see on the picture of the slide here, the flow of information is always going to be the same, um, whether it's a debit or a credit payment, the authorization has to come from the receiver. That is the account holder whose account is going to be impacted, either debited or credited. They will provide an authorization in whatever form is required to what we call the originator who creates the payment. They send it through the ODFI, their financial institution, flows through one of those two ACH operators that I just mentioned onto the RDFI, and then ultimately, as I started uh, with the receiver, their account is impacted. So again, this flow does not change whether it is a debit or a credit transaction. The only thing that changes there is the flow of the funds. So in a little bit more detail, who is an originator? An originator is that party which initiates the ACH payment. So again, because we have both debits and credits in the network, um, we need to think about this in terms of who is creating the actual payment that is going to go into the network, not necessarily who's credited or debited. The originator can be a company, an organization. It can be a government agency. The federal government is actually the largest single user of the ACH network um, and then followed on by you know, the state and local governments as well. And a consumer actually can be an originator as well. Um, they must have authorization from the receiver. That can be in many different types of, of uh, formats. For example, a credit still needs to be authorized. However, a credit to a consumer could be authorized verbally. Um, whereas a debit transaction, um, if it is taking place over the internet, may have specific requirements as to what that authorization needs to look like. But that originator must have an authorization from the receiver. The only exception there is where we call out P2P payments. And that's because, <laughs> excuse me, the consumer is the originator and we do not have the same uh, types of requirements on a consumer originator as we do an organization that is creating a payment. Some of those organizations I mentioned, government, schools, colleges, charities, utilities. I'm sure a lot of people are used to, uh, you know, paying some, their electric bill, things like that, um, through a direct payment, and that's flowing through the ACH network. The originator has to submit the transaction through a financial institution. An organization um, is not going to have direct access 99% um, of the time, they're not going to have direct access into the actual network. So they must submit a file through their financial institution, which we call the ODFI, Originating Depository Financial Institution. I will mention there can be third parties that can sit in between these steps that we're talking about today, um, but these are the basic uh, parties within a, a transaction. So that ODFI is the party, again, that's going to put that transaction into the ACH network, and they are the party who is warranting each transaction that they submit into the network and that it is correct, it is authorized, and um, that they have all of the necessary agreements um, both between them and their originator and that the originator has an agreement with them to be doing business and everybody agrees that they're going to abide by the NACHA operating rules. Again, as I mentioned before, the um, exclusion there is, is for consumers. We have don't make them uh, abide by the same uh, stringent requirements. The middle piece here, the switch, if you will, is the ACH operator. So they are the central clearing facility. They're going to be taking in the files from the ODFIs 
These are batch files. Remember, ACH is a batch network. So they are going to then unbatch those transactions, determine their where they need to go, where they're supposed to be received, and then they are going to create the outgoing files to send to those receiving financial institution. As I said, there is the Federal Reserve as well as the Clearinghouse, two different operators. Both can be involved in a payment. One can be involved in a payment. It just depends on who um, is providing the service to that financial institution. The operator is actually the party that is performing settlement, which is the movement of the money between the financial institutions. So once they've um, created those outgoing files, then they will start um, creating the settlement entries and the accounts, the Federal Reserve accounts of those financial institutions will be adjusted based on those transactions that were processed within that processing window. The files are then sent off to the, uh, per the receiving depository financial institution or the RDFI. They're the financial institution that holds the account of the receiver. So they're going to receive the file and then they're going to do everything they can to post those transactions. They have requirements um, of when they have to do that. So for credits, there are funds availability requirements that they must abide by. And for debits, there are no sooner than requirements that they must abide by. There is the capability for an RDFI to return a transaction if they are not able to post it, but there are specific timeframes within the uh, NACHA operating rules that they must abide by in order to do so. And then finally, again, we have that receiver. So the receiver is the party whose account is going to be impacted. They are also the ones who have provided the authorization. So if I am paying my electric bill, Amy is the receiver. I am going to give my authorization to the electric company. The electric company is going to send the file to their financial institution, the ODFI. It'll go through the operator. It'll come to Amy's financial institution as the RDFI. And then ultimately that RDFI is going to um, post that debit to my account. So once again, that receiver can be an individual, it can be an organization, and it can also be a government agency, same as, uh, as on the origination side. So now that we've covered who those parties are, I want to just quickly touch on sort of the contractual hierarchy, because oftentimes we get questions about rule enforcement. I mentioned the ODFI is the party who is warranting the correctness of the transaction, the information that it is authorized properly, um, et cetera. So they are the parties who are signing agreements with those operators and baked into those operator agreements are their obligations and their agreements to abide by the NACHA operating rules and provide these warranties and indemnifications. Originators, and as I mentioned before, there can be different kinds of third parties who may sit in between and help that process, but third parties and originators are going to have contracts with the ODFIs, the financial institutions. So if something goes wrong, if, there, if NACHA receives notice of a potential rules violation from another party in the network, NACHA is going to go to the financial institution, the ODFI, and that is where our enforcement process lies. There are rules that require originators and third parties to perform certain activities, but it is the ODFI that is warranting that they are doing so. So if you are not a financial institution and you have questions about enforcement, penalties, things of that nature, you need to be speaking to your ODFIs because any action that would be passed on to you from NACHA is going to be as a result of that ACH origination contract that you've signed with your ODFI. NACHA has been very risk focused over the last several years. Um, and so many of the rules that we have passed um, have been risk 
focused. And so I'll call out a couple of those um, that may be of interest, uh, but you can find all of the details related to all of the rules as they pass out on our website under the uh, rules section. We had the account validation for web debits, also known as supplementing um, uh, supplementing fraud detection for web debits, uh, which, as I said, is affectionately known as the account validation rule. And this is a requirement for online payments that can be through a browser, mobile, uh, text, different uh, kinds of devices, anything that's over an online channel. If it's the first time that a consumer account is being used, that account number must be validated. So that rule took effect last year, 2021. Uh, it began enforcement in March of this year. And so hopefully this is something, you know, that folks are, are very aware of. And if not, you are underway if this rule applies to you. The next one that's coming up is around micro entries. Micro entries or uh, penny tests or test transactions um, are not new, but they are um, becoming um, more widespread, particularly because of the account validation requirement. This is one way to validate an account number and in theory that somebody has access to it. So these new rules that are being phased in are um, going to basically standardize the micro entry process. Again, not a new type of transaction, they just were never defined under the NACHA operating rules previously. And so phase one defines them as a transaction type and indicates the formatting that needs to be used. And then phase two in March of next year, um, requires that originators of micro entries uh, employ commercially reasonable fraud detection so they can make sure that their systems are not being abused by fraudsters. So those rules, where do they come from? It is a living document. We have a rules and operations committee who votes on our rules and then we move through a proposal and it, it is a uh, public, um, process. And again, every year we are publishing a new, um, I call it a book, uh, but it is also of a digital variety. And throughout the year, we are making changes. And so it's important to sign up for things like Nacha's Rule News so that you are aware of these changes that can be happening throughout the year. I also wanted to call out um, a, uh, a great resource that we have out on our website, which is a guide. It's called Protecting Against Cyber Fraud, but really you don't even need the word cyber there because these different types of attacks can happen through any channel. This is recently updated at the end of last year and again is found out on our website, covers all the types of frauds that you see um, over on the left-hand side, business email, vendor, payroll, and it talks about what it is, as well as how to avoid um, falling prey to these scams, both for financial institutions, as well as information to provide um, to your uh, customers. Some real world examples here of how we have seen these things happen. Vendor impersonation. We've seen two specific, we've seen many more, but two specific examples. Of county school systems that actually were right next door to each other um, where a vendor was able to, or excuse me, a fraudster was able to see um, the vendor contracts because a public school system is being a government entity, their contracts are for the public record. And so the vendor poses, excuse me, the fraudster poses as the vendor and contacts the school system and says, hey, my banking information has changed, so redirect my payments in the future to this new account number. The county would make the change, so now we've severed the tie between the true vendor and the county, and now the fraudster is just going to sit there and wait um, until the next invoice is scheduled to be paid, and the money is going to go to the fraudster, and the true vendor is never going to uh, see those funds. Um, and so again, we've got lots of tips on how to try to avoid falling prey for, again, um, the uh, originators, third parties, as well as those financial institutions in our booklet online. And then finally, the last example I wanted to mention is that it is very important that when you have 
third parties involved that there is due diligence still happening for the third party customers. We have new rules that talk about this concept of a nested third party, which means a third party that is going through another third party, and this can happen level after level. We had a couple of years ago an incident where um, payroll situation was going through nested third parties, and unfortunately, somebody was able to alter the actual file, um, not the ACH file, but the file that was being sent between the companies to change where the funding for the payroll was supposed to go. And he put it to his personal account instead of the offset for all of the payroll transactions. This was not caught in time. And all of those payroll transactions went out to the tune of, you know, tens of millions of dollars without ever being funded. And this was as a result of a, a lack of due diligence and understanding all of the parties that were within the chain, as well as having appropriate controls to ensure that things were not being uh, changed within the information. The last thing I will mention is, um, this is not in included in the fraud guide, um, but the Example was a mass redirection, but there's also issues of um, individual payroll redirection where somebody poses as an employee and changes the account number. NACHA has created an optional standard that will allow for um, easy identification of payroll transactions, including ones that are being sent for the very first time, that will help with risk mitigation and identifying those types of transactions the first time they come through so that we can make sure, hey, yeah, this is the account that it's really supposed to go to. So lots and lots of things happening on the Notcha side focused on risk. I would thank you so much for allowing me to be here with Modern Treasury and Settle and all of you today. And I'll turn it back over to Parnav to uh, move us on to our next section. Thank you, Amy, for that comprehensive overview. Um, looking forward to diving into it a little bit deeper in our uh, Q&A uh, panel discussion at the end of the presentations. But next up, um, I'd like to introduce Eric who is a product manager for compliance at Modern Treasury. Modern Treasury is a um, third-party service provider in NACHA parlance, so we make it really easy for companies to originate and receive ACH payments. And so having appropriate controls for fraud and risk is, is really top of mind for us here. And so I'm gonna hand it off to him to, to walk you through um, our approach to managing fraud and risk and, and some of the products that we've built. Uh, over to you, Eric. Thanks, Pranav. So I'm going to give a presentation in, in three parts. First, I'll give a, a little bit of an overview of modern treasury and what do we do. Next, I'm going to talk about why are we building products in the compliance and fraud space. And lastly, I'll tell you about what we've built and, and how it helps reduce fraud and uh, help companies stay compliant uh, and also uh, kind of adhere to not just rules. So starting off with Modern Treasury, what do we do? Modern Treasury builds software for high volume payment flows. At a very high level, you can connect your bank accounts. Uh, with Modern Treasury, you can then move money over different payment rails, ACH, wire, RTP, uh, using modern APIs kind of built for developers. You can reconcile payments automatically and instantly, and also have a single source of truth for bank accounts, balances, and transactions. And overall, we can move money quickly, even faster than third-party um, senders because we don't actually sit in the flow of funds. Uh, this is very important. It's just an API that you can use to, to make payments uh, and kind of connect to your, your bank accounts here. And overall, I'd say we serve two different uh, users mainly. So there's developers and also finance and operations teams. For developers, I think of Modern Treasury as a, a way to programmatically move money around. You can automate complex payment flows using very modern REST APIs and developer tools. No longer you have to go to some web console somewhere and uh, you know, manually be paying people money. You can do this programmatically. You can also with Modern Treasury, it's a unified interface to, to connect to different bank accounts. We've also built out other tools that help move money such as ledgers and virtual accounts. For payment operations teams, we've built tools that help save a lot of manual effort and, and time and, and centralize some of these workflows. 
So we, we see a lot of customers building out huge teams to understand where are payments coming from, who is paid, who hasn't paid. Modern Treasury can automate a lot of that. Uh, that reconciliation process that happen every month, every quarter. We've also built out different tools to help with things like payment approvals. Overall, uh, we see users going into our web app uh, and kind of as a central hub for, for understanding the entire payments lifecycle and, and all the different payments going on. Modern Treasury is very industry and use case agnostic. We have customers across a wide range of industries, marketplaces, fintech, investing, bill pay, crypto, insurance, lending, the list goes on and on. Anyone who moves money uh, is someone who I think can be a customer. We've been reconciling over $2 billion in, in payment volume each month, and kind of that's been rapidly increasing. So that's a little bit about modern treasury. Next, I'm gonna to start to talk about why do we build compliance and fraud products? I think of three main reasons. First is customer pain. Uh, when I go and talk to our, our hundreds of customers, I heard a lot of customers struggling with these topics. Fraud can happen at almost all companies that move money. Uh, many companies that we work with are, are small and fast growing. Uh, and are often underprepared, uh, kind of, or victims of their own success and haven't set up robust programs for fraud and compliance, and all of a sudden are, are facing attacks. We also see that it's a necessity. It's not really a, a nice to have, it's a must have for, for companies. Uh, companies are subject to Bank Secrecy Act regulations that try to prevent money laundering and terrorism financing. And overall, we, we see companies uh, kind of slow to, to set up tools in this space. They're, they're trying to evaluate and integrate different vendors, but it's really hard. It's, it's no one's core competency to, to do this generally, um, especially younger companies. And so it often takes kind of time and effort and resources away from uh, kind of their, their principal activities of building products and, and going to market. Second, we think that this area is better managed by experts. Fraudsters are always changing tactics. It's the, the fun cat and mouse game. One of the reasons I enjoy actually working in this space. Additionally, the compliance landscape really varies by state and country. And so when you, when you think about having to, um, to, to build tools and manage compliance and fraud, it's really complex and, and time consuming. There's also a lot of benefits to doing them at scale when you can see data across many customers. Uh, third, I saw a lack of fully integrated solutions. And when I talked to customers, I, I heard them saying, oh, I'm stitching together you know, two, three, four, you know, even 10 different systems and data sources for compliance, fraud, and, and payment operations. It really blew my mind. And I heard customers saying it takes a significant amount of time to integrate and, and manage these, these tools. And there's many different you know, layers you can go to all the way down to uh, ground truth data providers, uh, to, to purchasing vendors that uh, you know, integrate some of those data providers and provide a one-stop shop for KYC or transaction monitoring. But even then we see customers stitching together multiple of these tools uh, and also figuring out how to integrate that with their payment operations. And so I saw a big opportunity to create our product in this space. And so what do we build? Um, next handful of slides to discuss some of the, the areas that we've worked on. A couple of things that we've, we've built um, are one to help with account validation. And you can do this a couple of ways with Modern Treasury. You can do so with micro deposits as well as instant verification with, with Plaid. This is super helpful for, for companies trying to adhere to not just guidelines. So first off, micro deposits. Uh, with Modern Treasury, you can quickly and easily send uh, a couple payments to an account, and then the counterparty can then return those payments to verify themselves. Uh, you know, a nice thing about micro deposits, they work with any bank account, uh, but kind of a downside, they, they take a couple of days to go through this, this process. Modern Treasury customers can also 
uh, take advantage of instant verification with Plaid. That's where you know, our customer's customer can um, you know, pass through their, their bank account information. And then with Plaid, kind of do the, the account validation and kind of confirm the, the ownership um, as well as like the account is, is open. It's, it's a really nice user experience using Plaid. Um, but you know, on the downside, not all bank accounts actually support Plaid. Um, and some users can actually be reluctant to, uh, to grant access to, to bank accounts. But overall, both of these methods for account validation are, are super helpful. And it's something that I uh, see lots of customers using and are very happy with to, to help. Next, I wanna uh, go into more detail about our, our new compliance and fraud product that we, we launched uh, almost, you know, maybe coming up on a, a month ago now. And I, I think about it in a, a few different pieces. So one, we built out an embeddable onboarding flow. This makes it really easy for um, kind of our customers to collect information about their customers and then move money to them, all without storing any personally identifiable information. And this embeddable onboarding flow is, is super easy uh, to, to embed for developers. Uh, you know, it's just a, a few lines of, of JavaScript that you have to put into your application. You can get up and, and running. Second, we built out some KYC identity verification. And so once that user has entered in their information, we're conducting a, a wide variety of checks on that user, which are super helpful for recognizing fraudulent actors and also identifying potential compliance issues. Third, we've built out transaction monitoring, which is really easy to enable. You can do so just kind of with a single line of code change that guarantees that all transactions are, are tracked for fraud and money laundering risk, any payment order that happens with modern treasury. And lastly, we've built out some case management tools that help streamline this manual review process and provide an audit trail for, for oversight. And overall, we're really centralizing uh, both kind of compliance, fraud, and payment operations all into the same platform here. That's what's so powerful and really differentiated about our approach. Going deeper into these, these various areas, starting with that user onboarding, when you think about fraud, uh, you know, oftentimes they're using stolen or synthetic identities and trying to gain access to an account or open up a new account. And so we have a variety of, of checks in place that help detect this behavior. So starting with database validations, once the user enters their information, we're checking it against a variety of ground truth databases, I think from telecom companies, DMVs, Social Security Administration, et cetera, and looking to see if that information matches other records. And these checks are, are really helpful to see uh, if this person has maybe um, generated a, a new synthetic identity or, or possibly stolen identity, but doesn't have all the details quite right. Second, we built out some pretty advanced behavior and device intelligence. And how about this looking at how is the user engaging with that onboarding form? You know, they, they copy and pasting their names, for example, this is something that we, we see fraudsters doing, but a typical user, you, you might, you typically type out your own name because you, you know, you know, you, you know, it by heart, um, versus maybe a bank account, you might copy and paste information because you actually don't know it. We can also look at device information. So that's looking at uh, browsers and, and user agents and IP addresses. For example, we can see if, um, you know, an IP address looks like a, a VPN. That's usually a, you know, a small predictor for fraud. It's many of these signals together that we're, we're using, by the way. Uh, thirdly, phone data. Uh, what can we look at from, from phone records? Uh, for example, here, uh, you know, if we can determine it's a, a VoIP number or maybe there's uh, limited activity going on with that phone number or activity going on from high-risk countries, these are all potential indicators of, of fraud. We also perform sanctions and adverse media checks. It's a little bit more helpful for, for the compliance side of things, uh, for anti-money laundering and, and Bank Secrecy Act compliance. We're checked to see if that user is on any government watch list, such as OFAC, 
uh, SDN PEP, just help find any potential compliance violations. Fifth, email validation. What can we glean from the email domain and email address that's being used? Uh, we commonly see new domains being used by fraudsters. They'll spin up a domain. Maybe it's similar to another one, but with a little bit of a, a typo. And then to Amy's example, pretending to be a, a vendor. Uh, these are things that we, we, can, we can catch by looking at email data. Uh, and lastly, the sixth thing, bank history. Uh, what can we learn from bank account records? Uh, for example, if we see that that bank account has maybe a history of returns or OFAC warnings, these are all potential signs of, of fraud. Next, with transaction monitoring, um, I want to talk a little bit about our approach to, to all this, but um, overall with transaction monitoring, you can monitor any payment that goes on with modern treasury and with the flick of a, a switch. We're looking for evidence of fraud and money laundering. And the approach for, for this, as well as for the user onboarding and KYC checks, is a combination of machine learning and rules. So machine learning, we're looking at data across many, many customers and, and training models to, to look for fraud and AML risk. We also have a, a rule engine here in the, the background. So uh, you know, there's out of the box rules that you can you can use to kind of catch common patterns, but it's also really easy to create new ones. In transaction monitoring, for example, you might be looking for uh, you know new accounts with higher than usual transaction volumes, or maybe a dormant account that's now being active. And our solution really helps with automation. Uh, you know, any higher risk transactions are automatically flagged and declined. Lowest ones are automatically approved. This can help improve, op improve operational efficiency so that our, our customers are spending less time uh, in the portal reviewing transactions or user onboardings. Lastly, on the security and privacy front, this is incredibly important to us at Modern Treasury how we can handle PII safely. For customers, you can move money without storing any PII. Uh, if you use our embeddable onboarding form, you can collect bank account details and create counterparties, move money to those users, all without storing any PII on your own servers, which is a huge benefit. And on the modern treasury side, a few things that we do to, to keep data safe. We have role-based access control. so. Uh, only certain of your users can have permissions to compliance-related features. We also encrypt PII and, and use a, a key management system as well. Uh, and so overall, I'm, I'm super excited that we, we've built some of these, these products to help our customers um, you know, with one platform do compliance, fraud, and payment operations, and they can get to market faster without all the heavy lifting typically required. And that's all I have for today. Thanks for listening and I'll turn it back over to you, Pranav. Thanks, Eric. Um, and thank you, Amy, as well for setting the stage here. Uh, oftentimes, uh, understanding concepts and figuring out what tools you need is, is one part of the problem, but actually doing it in practice is usually what's um, harder. And so that's why I wanted to kick off uh, the discussion by um, handing things off to George uh, to, to give us a sense for how um, Settle uh, stood up its compliance and fraud programs. Um, what were some of the hardest parts about doing that, George, and, and how did you approach that um, at Settle and, and how do you do that on an ongoing basis? Yeah, thank you, Pranav. Um, and thank you for having me for, uh, for this. Um, I think one of the most important things is to be familiar with the organization that you're working in. Um, you need to know the product offerings, your primary markets, uh, customer profiles, and what your company's growth goals are. From there, you can uh, create a risk appetite, which allows you to assess where your current program stands, where your exposure and pitfalls are, and how you can start to plug those gaps. Um, I think the program, though, is only as good as the people that you have. So you need to build an experienced and non-knowledgeable team 
which I think Settle has done a great job of doing. Um, we have a combination of people with uh, traditional banking backgrounds like myself, as well as people that come more from the tech space. So we sort of have complementary abilities. Um, as for the part about what's uh, the hardest parts, um, I would say when joining a smaller company, um, there are definitely res uh, resource constraints that you need to consider that are not as, uh, as pre uh, prevalent when you work for a bigger bank. You know, you sort of have to uh, determine whether you're going to um, buy a solution versus building it in-house, but you have to balance that against um, how much funds you actually have to do that versus your employee bandwidth. So it's definitely been a learning experience. Um, it's also important to have an organizational commitment to compliance. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when you set a good tone early on, it makes it much easier to create a good program. Just to maybe follow up on what you said, um, what are some of the processes you've implemented, operationally speaking, to ensure um, fraud stays at a minimum um, and your users get their money on time, you know, complying with ACH um, rules, et cetera? Sure. So um, <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to be hired uh, pretty early into the company's establishment, and that's actually allowed Settle to... Uh, create a compliance program earlier than a lot of other fintechs do. Um, because of that, uh, I, I think uh, we've been able to sort of create a program that, uh, that can allow us to uh, address the emerging challenges uh, earlier by sort of having people within the organization understand the importance of compliance. Got it. Thanks, George. Um, Amy, maybe over to you. Um, I, you opened your section by talking about just the massive growth in, uh, in the ACH network, right? Over, you know, over the last year, but just this decade, if you look at the charts, it's always up and to the right. So I'm curious um, how that's informed, how you think about um, risk on the network, given that that's corresponding to a lot of newer use cases that maybe the network originally wasn't designed for before and had to, adopt to uh, adapt to. So how has that sort of influenced rulemaking at NACHA and in general, how you think about risk on the network? Yeah, great question. Absolutely. So I would say first and foremost, we have been being um, proactive. Um, a lot of the rule changes that we have made um, are what we call our risk and quality bucket. Um, but it's not that we felt that there was an issue that was happening in the network. We're very, you know, we remain the, you know, the channel with the lowest amount of fraud in the U.S. So it wasn't, you know, being reactive. It was being proactive because, as you said, the, you know, significant growth that we continue to enjoy. Um, prior to the pandemic, you know, we were seeing a lot of growth in the P2P space. Um, you know, we were seeing B2B growth um, and we were seeing gains in the healthcare space. Uh, once the pandemic happened, we saw things further accelerate. Um, the P2, excuse me, the business to business um, growth basically doubled the rate of what we had been seeing the last several years. I think we all understand that the challenges of not being able to get together really was a catalyst for um, businesses to that hadn't made their shift over to electronic payments to make that happen. And I don't think we're gonna be seeing that going backwards. Um, and we even have seen growth in consumers shopping online. I think we had kind of thought that that had plateaued, but it hadn't. Um, we've seen it jump again since the pandemic. And so, um, these rule changes that we've talked about today are things, you know, that we started working on five, six years ago, um, but they are still very timely and making sure that we're able to secure the transactions just as we always have and continue to be, you know, the safe and secure network that, that we've always been. Thanks, Sammy. Um, and so that's maybe a good segue to you, Eric, um, in terms of uh, what you've learned working with customers uh, so far on um, just how, what are the risk factors and risk vectors for fraud and um, how did that kind of influence how how you've thought about building the compliance product at MT? Yeah, absolutely. So there's so many ways that, that fraud can occur at these, these companies. 
Uh, I generally think about it in a couple of different stages though. Processors first have to get access to an account and they usually do so by either signing up with a stolen identity or a synthetic identity, or they can also try to take over an account. We think about how do attackers get access to an identity, uh, you know, if they're stealing it, it can be done with a, a data breach, uh, an insecure, unsecured website, users being on public computers. Uh, this happens less frequently now, but even dumpster diving is, is a way of getting access to, to people's information. If you think about um, maybe your, your credit card bills or, or other things that you have at home. And then there's a, what's really risen in popularity is social engineering and, and phishing scams. And um, you know, it's a particularly nasty way where attackers pose as different people in your life and try to get information from, from you. Attackers can also use synthetic identities, uh, maybe where they have a potentially valid social security number, but fake other personal information. Uh, and the last thing on the account takeovers, uh, that's when the attackers steal credentials from a user and then sign into their accounts. Uh, often this is done from a, a phishing attack um, and, and can happen in a, in a few different ways. Once an attacker has access to an account, uh, they're then usually trying to do transactions and, and move money around. Uh, and this could potentially be opening up credit cards or other lines of credit, taking out loans, uh, paying bills for themselves, uh, making fraudulent purchases, even withdrawing money from, from accounts. When we think about uh, kind of these different steps in, in fraud and account access and transactions, uh, this is where we've also applied protections for our customers. So we have the, the user onboarding and KYC checks that we do try to catch fraud um, you know, right when the fraudsters are signing up for a service. And then there's also the ongoing transaction monitoring to, to catch if an attacker does get, a, does get an account or takes over an account and is then trying to do fraud. Um, you know, we try to stop that before any money movement takes place. Got it. And then maybe over to you, George, um, seeing your background, there's risk and compliance in banking. You were at Deutsche Bank in City, um, where you had to implement a lot of those programs. And now you're at a fast growing technology company, Settle. Um, how, how is that change? How has that transition been in terms of um, applying um, what you've learned at banking or, or learning new ways to, to think about compliance at Settle? Um, as you've as you've moved moved industries in that sense. Sure, uh, it's definitely been a great transition. Um, I think uh, my time in consulting and banking allowed me to uh, learn the proper tools for how to assess, implement, and enhance controls programs. Um, but it also gave me a lot of insight into the shortcomings uh, that happen with a lot of uh, financial institutions. A lot of them have legacy systems in place. They've sort of placed their compliance program on top of systems that have been around for decades in some cases. Um, and so I have tried to leverage those experiences to try to build our program from the ground up to prevent those same pitfalls uh, before they happen. You know, it's, it's a little bit easier when you're a smaller tech focused company to be a little bit more limber and able to adapt to new, um, new changes in in the text here. And so to, to follow up on that, George, um, what kinds of fraud are you most worried about um, at Settle that you maybe may not have really thought of that much in banking? Um, well, I would say any fraud that's targeting us directly. But um, honestly, uh, it sounds like a joke, but startups really are more of a prime target for fraudsters because the investment in compliance is not nearly as robust as something like a Citibank. Um, so the programs tend to be less sophisticated and that's why we need to be incredibly diligent on our end to make sure that we have strong programs that help us uh, you know, stay up to date with, uh, with the latest types of fraud. Um, you know, both Amy and Eric alluded to account takeovers. Um, those are obviously harder to deal with because um, most of them will pretty easily pass through automated KYC checks. Um, they'll often use clone websites. And that's why it's very important to have uh, 
you know, both experienced staff that can uh, readily identify these sort of things, as well as uh, a, a very robust transaction monitoring program where your rules uh, will sort of pick up on anomalies in transactions and hopefully help you minimize uh, the amount of losses that, that you could be exposed to. Got it. And then maybe over to you, Amy, just to, to chat about fraud on ACH, given the fact that it's both debit and credit. Um, are there different types of fraud or risk factors for ACH debits over ACH credits? And, and how should organizations be, be generally be thinking about um, each of those uh, you know, modes of payment on ACH? Sure. So, yes. I would say there there are different perhaps use cases um, between debit and credit. Um, you know, there can be a, a fraud where, you know, I'm going to uh, utilize fictional information because I want to make a purchase or pay my bill and I don't want the money to actually have to come uh, from me. Um, and then there's, so that would be on the debit side. And then on the credit side, you know, there's the redirection of funds. But I think honestly, Honestly, that a lot of the mitigations are very similar. Taking advantage of account validation, while the rule that, you know, NACHA has is specific to capital W-E-B, web debits, which are consumer debits, account validation is a best practice for any kind of transaction. Corporate, if it's possible, um, those are not as, the corporate uh, solutions are not quite as robust, but they're starting to catch up. Um, as well as using on, on credits as well. Um, our minimum requirement under our rule is to make sure that the account number is valid and able to accept ACH transactions. Um, but there's a, you know, a myriad of other types of services that are available out there in terms of validating the ownership of the account, validating, you know, as, as Eric was talking about, some of the activities, um, you know, even down to understanding the behaviors and does the ID match and does all the information make sense. I think that, you know, these things are applicable across both the, the, the fraud use cases for debits and credits. Um, and so I think that, you know, while we've always tended in the past on the ACH side to kind of focus in on the, the debit side, you know, a lot of these tools are applicable uh, across the board. And then Eric, maybe to put that all together for us, right? What do you think uh, a best in class uh, com risk and compliance software stack looks like? Uh, you know, a set of tools that's able to deal with all of these different scenarios. Like if, if I were to if I were starting one from scratch, like what should be on my checklist? Well, best in class, I hope modern treasury is the, the answer to that. Um, but maybe I'll start by talking about what we see customers doing right now and um, maybe also touch on our product. So what I see customers generally doing in the, in the marketplace, I typically see customers integrating two, three, four, even more different vendors for compliance fraud payment operations. Um, you think about a solution for KYC, a solution for transaction monitoring, maybe another solution for a suspicious activity report filing, you know, some other solution for, for payments, uh, maybe even additional uh, you know, contracts with ground truth databases for more coverage. Uh, we see just many, many tools being stitched together. Um, and I'm starting to see some consolidation um, with some vendors doing both KYC and transaction monitoring, much like, like we are, um, but still some of these solutions are separate from payment operations. As a result, uh, we see that customers are really delayed in their, their time to market. Uh, these companies, especially startups, have so much work to do. Uh, as George mentioned, really limited engineering resources. So evaluating, integrating, managing these different vendors takes a lot of time. Um, and it's really not um, you know, core, core competency or core focus for, for many customers. We also see some downtime if you know, all these solutions need to work well together. Um, and when customers are building these different systems, uh, you know, things can break and be brittle. And that can mean to uh, you know, downtime and ultimately loss of revenue for the business. And the third thing, uh, you know, a poor consequence we sometimes see is fraud or compliance violations. It can be really hard to prioritize some of this, this work. Um, I'm really thankful to work with George. It sounds like he's been able to 
to, to get silicon on board and building these programs out early, but that's not always the case with, with some customers out there. So we see some companies not having proper coverage. This can lead to fraud or compliance violations, um, and those can really impact the bottom line. But I think what we'll, we'll see in hopefully a few years, that best in class solution is this, uh, what we're building, which is this integrated solution for compliance, fraud, and payment operations, you know, all from the same tool. Um, this helps companies stand up uh, compliance and, and fraud programs from day one, instead of waiting until longer and being exposed. So we're almost at time here, but I wanted to close by one final question to you, George. Um, what does the roadmap for compliance look like at Settle? Um, what are you looking to do next um, that's on your list? Sure. Uh, so now that we've uh, identified where our gaps were in the program um, and which ones are most pressing based on our risk exposure, uh, you know, got a sense of what controls are fully formed and which ones are stop gaps. Uh, we are now working towards enhancing all of those control controls, uh, strengthening them through better on automation, fine tuning our transaction monitoring rules, um, pairing with reputable providers who know how to provide to use our phrase, best in class services. And I think all of these things together are what we look for when we're looking to, you know, down the road uh, to make sure that we are covered for, you know, new and more sophisticated types of fraud. Awesome. Well, Amy, George, Eric, thank you so much again for taking the time to be with us today. Um, it's been a fantastic conversation. I've certainly learned a ton. Um, and I'm hoping um, it's similarly insightful uh, for the audience. Um, with that, just kind of close today's discussion. Um, and if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to us at Modern Treasury. Um, here's Eric's email if you want to learn more about the compliance product you're building or, or anything else related to how, how we're thinking about uh, some of these topics moving forward. Um, otherwise, you can always check us out at moderntreasury.com to learn more about our products. Thanks for joining us today and uh, have a great day.